Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 20. So as you can see from the title slide, we'll be talking about open source project development. So we're actually going to kind of have flavors of both. We're going to be talking about just project development in general, kind of best practices and such, as well as some features unique to open source. And so I said, this is kind of, you know, part of our, you know, three lecture sequence, kind of closing out the quarter where we're kind of covering some more of these um, details aren't so nitty gritty in language and more just kind of about general process and how to best do things. And so we want to kind of get into that. So maybe it's good to start off thinking about what would the ideal code look like, right? What would be like, oh, that, that code would be so great. What would be so great or make it so great, right? Well, first off, it needs to be correct, right? It needs to do the right thing and not just some of the time, but every time, right? And, you know, hey, sometimes it's okay to have constraints, right? You can say, hey, if these inputs are infeasible, let your users know that, right? Have, you know, error message and say, hey, you gave me inputs and you didn't obey these constraints and you didn't obey that, right? And it's one thing to have code that's actually correct. It's another thing to be convinced you're correct or be able to convince someone else is correct, right? And so we're also gonna kind of talk about what makes it convincing that code is correct, right? And how do you convince others your code is correct? Okay, so that's just correctness, right? Well, what about other features that might make, you know, code so ideal? Well, um, is it easy to work with and understand, right? You know, when you go diving around the source directory or opening up files, does it make sense? Do you kind of have a sense of where you're going or are you looking at every file like it's cryptic in a language you've written before, even though it's a language you definitely know, right? No, you, you want that to be very clear and easy. And, oh, if you want to go add something, you go change this function. You go figure out where you need to go change and you go change that one little thing, right? Uh, and better yet, actually, you don't need to change the code. Maybe instead you can... Uh, write your own code separately out of that source tree and then call into the code exists like a library or something, right? And so how well is that code structured? Is it easy to understand? Is it well documented, et cetera, et cetera? And then finally, of course, performance, right? Um, as an HPC kind of person, I often think about performance quite a bit, but uh, in the case of some of the stuff we're dealing with right here, it's not necessarily quite the, the most important constraint, but it's still worth considering, right? And the way I'll kind of relax that constraint a little bit say, you know, what about, you just say efficient. And by efficient, I'm just saying, you know, given the things we're doing, there's not much room left to further improve in performance kind of way of defining it. You can imagine, you know, maybe, you know, if we're doing things in Scala, if you were to write, you know, really carefully crafted C++, maybe you can make things go faster, but that's just a totally different world, right? And so, uh, you know, given, you know, we're doing Scala and given, you know, these are the algorithms that exist for this problem you're doing, you know, you just kind of, you know, a bound what you can do and that's okay if you're close to it right and so uh these are all things that would be wonderful if code had right if, if, these, if you have all these things in your code that would be like the ideal code right the reason why i'm listing these is not just because there's ambiguity what ideal code is but also because i want to point out that it's basically impossible to do this on your first writing of a code right the first time you implement something the first time you write it down it's going to be hard to get all three of these right it's going to be hard to even get one of these right um, usually, just to get the thing working, we're, we're worried most about that first one, correctness, right? You're trying to write that first version of the code, the first draft. Um, you should want to make it correct, right? But, you know, eventually maybe we we'll check the performance, we start refactoring it, documenting it. And so like we've been talking about all quarter, right? You know, close the loop and, you know, use an agile process to kind of iteratively improve, right? You're going to need to revise and improve, right? And so that's what today's talk's going to be about, right? Is today's lecture is going to be talking about the tools, techniques, and processes you'll use to kind of iteratively, iteratively develop and improve a code, right? Rather than being, you know, this vacuum where the code does not exist and all of a sudden, snap, all of a sudden there's magically created perfect code is ideal, that doesn't happen, right? It's a continuous process where you start building stuff and it's incomplete, it's a little buggy, it's not very easy to read and you keep working at it, right? You make it more clear, you make it better and you get pretty good code and then you decide, oh wait, you need more functionality, maybe adding functionality breaks it temporarily and you kind of keep going. So it's just continuous, never-ending process, right? And so to kind of navigate that space and to try and make sure we accomplish some of these goals of correctness, ease of use, as well as efficiency, you need to have a process, right? And so that's what today's gonna be about. Cool. So um, in particular, I'm gonna highlight a couple of uh, techniques or skills. You may have seen these uh, in your software work, if you've done a lot of software work. Uh, I suspect that very few students have seen all of them. Uh, so it'll be kind of good to kind of see some of these things uh, at work, right? Um, cool. So 
First off is something called continuous integration. I think we may mention this in passing, maybe you're already using in your projects. For example, if you clone from chisel template, it kind of makes this really, really easy to do. Um, but let's talk about what it is. So continuous integration is a way to use computer resources to kind of run your tests automatically, right? And so the motivation is that, you know, if you have a lot of developers working on a project and you're kind of constantly adding things and doing things, once your project gets beyond a certain size, you aren't really kind of constantly thinking about everything all at once, right? Imagine if you have, like, you know, a 10 line piece of code, like even like a Jupyter notebook, you change something, you're probably gonna basically like test everything before you, you know, move on, right? But you start having a project with thousands of lines, multiple contributors, and then all of a sudden, you know, you change one thing and for all you know, you um, broke something else, even though you may fix the thing you're trying to work on, right? And so uh, it's very common in these large projects that bugs just kind of creep in, right? Uh, and, you know, a classic scenario is not so much you created the bug, it's more that the bug was always there. Uh, it's just a certain combination of actions recently has caused it to manifest or be exposed, right? Um, and so in the spirit of, you know, making the tools do the work, wouldn't it be great if we could have, you know, tools try and help us find bugs, right? And so the idea of CI or continuous integration is to let's automatically run tests uh, frequently to see if we can't, you know, catch these things. So maybe me as a developer doing stuff, you know, I'll be, you know, working on code. I may run some tests before I commit, but I may not run every last test every time uh, before I commit or push. Uh, with CI, we can let the tools do that, some of that for us, right? And so the idea is with this very frequent test running, we'll see a test failure earlier on, and thus we can catch a bug earlier on, hopefully save some human effort, right? And if you're saying this, well, wait a second, why, why do I need CI? Couldn't I just, you know, run every test uh, every time I commit something? You could, but of course, then all of a sudden now you're waiting for every test to complete, and for a big project, it may take hours or even a day. Um, and that's not really very practical. And also, hey, this is something that's very automatable. Why should you do that? The tools should do that. Make the tools do the work, right? Uh, and so that's kind of what we're doing. Um, and so some things people may not appreciate about having CI or testing in general is that it's not just about catching bugs, right? Um, it can be used kind of a lot of our context, right? So for example, if you are a user or potential user, you know, traveling on the internet trying to find code bases or code to consider, seeing a project has CI and the results are publicly visible, and let's say hopefully it says passing, uh, is a really good thing, right? That, that gives you some confidence, right? If there's um, no CI or especially no tests in a project you're considering adopting in your code, well, it's kind of like them saying, you know what? We don't want to spend the effort testing it. Why don't you test it, user? And guess what? Most users do not want to test someone else's code, right? That's not something they're interested in doing. They may do additional tests after your test to really, really, really make sure it's super strong, but it, zero tests is a, a non-starter for most people when they see a code base, right? And so CI is a great way to make your tests very visible and kind of show people that, yes, these tests aren't just things we wrote once and forgot about, but you know, we're continuously using them. They're continuously being checked. And that's kind of the point is that if you don't have tests in CI and it's kind of at the mercy of your developers calling a test, you know, for all you know, uh, eventually you may have a commit that breaks those tests, but you didn't know, right? And then, you know, a week or a month goes by and then someone tries to run a test and then all of a sudden, you know, 15 test cases fail. And maybe none, most of them aren't even related to the change they made. They're just the person got caught, you know, running the test most recently, right? And so using CI, running frequently really can kind of help that stuff. And so, as I said, beyond your own internal development, it can help things like uh, external stuff as well, right? So uh, let's say you try at least you code open source and you want people to con contribute. And then someone does contribute. They send you a pull request and you're really excited to look at it. And then you have to kind of wonder, oh, wait, uh, can I, you know, trust this code, right? So you kind of spend a lot of time scrutinizing and studying the code they sent. Continuous um, tests, especially run automatically like via CI, is a great way to uh, see the stuff early on, right? You can kind of get a quick sanity check, right? If they submit a pull request and it doesn't pass any of your tests, you can just respond, hey, you know what? Maybe you should make a change you need to pass the test first, right? Um, and so it's a really great way to kind of screen your sanity check things. Realize tests can do more than just test functionality. It can also test things like uh, style compliance, right? Is your code meeting certain style rules or whatever, right? Um, and uh, it's also helpful because, believe it or not, people may realize it's not just about contributing code to your project. Other people may 
be aware of your project. For example, let's say your project depends on another project, right? And the other project's really happy to have you as a dependence, right? They're eager to be used or excited about it. And guess what? They want to change something. They're like, you know, we're going to change this thing. We don't think it's going to be an API change, but we want to make sure it doesn't break anything. Well, having your tests easily available allows them to do that, right? They can go ahead and, um, uh, you know, run your tests on their modified version of dependence and see, oh, wait, did, did we break anything, right? And CI is a way to kind of make this all easy to automate and check. Uh, I think I saw a chat come in. Yeah, so very astute comment from a student is, you know, setting up an open source, uh, you know, uh, repo should be a course in itself. Definitely, definitely. So yeah, so today is a uh, one lecture uh, brief on this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm going to link from a wonderful guest lecture from last time this course was taught, covering some more of the things that were covered. So we basically have like a 1.5, two lecture sequence on some of these concerns. But as suggested, you can easily do an entire uh, course on this. And I believe here at Santa Cruz, we actually do have that. I think there actually is a course on open source software taught uh, by uh, Professor uh, Carlos Maltzan, and that should be perhaps really interesting for some folks, right? Because, yeah, there's a lot of processes here, and um, it's good to kind of understand all that. But to kind of bring it back into the particular topic, we're talking about CI, right? So CI is, you know, automatically running tests, right? Okay. So uh, if we're going to try and do these automatically running tests, um, what do we need to set it up, right? What does it take to set up CI? You need three things. You need tests. You need a way to script and automate the execution of those tests, and you need a place to run them, right? Uh, those are kind of what it boils down to, right? So the tests, like I said, you should have tests anyways. Um, and I think CI is kind of this, you know, real big value add on the tests, you know, where you get way more bang on your tests if you have CI, right? Um, like I said, you can use them to screen pull requests. Other people can see your tests are working and they can get confidence in your project. You're running it continuously, frequently, you know, doing continuous integration with CI. You may uh, find bugs if you forgot to run tests like that, so it's great. Um, and sometimes people say, oh, well, the tests are helpful, but, you know, they don't catch everything, right? Um, that's a sign your tests are incomplete, right? Uh, if, if you think there's something that could be buggy, but pass your tests, you need to increase your test coverage. You need to figure out what cases am I not testing and make sure to test them. Right? Okay, in terms of automating this, there's a lot of stuff available. This is one of the places where there's a zillion different frameworks. So fortunately, usually you don't need to do a lot. Once you figure out a certain framework you're using, it eventually boils down to at some point you like put in, you know, a single line, like, you know, make test or SPT test, and then boom, you're done. It's, it's not too bad. Um, and usually this is, believe it or not, the majority of the effort for doing CI, right? Because you should already have tests. So beyond the effort of creating a test, um, uh, it's kind of one thing. Uh, the uh, For automation, of course, uh, like I said, that's usually where most effort goes to up CI. And, you know, it's one set of, you know, an hour or, or even less if it's a really simple setup. And then you're, you're, cook, you're cooking for months or years, right? So that's, that's, that's definitely time well spent. Finally, in the execution environment, um, you know, in the old days, you have to go grab a server for your, for your group and you get to set it up, put a distro on there, install a lot of software. No, no, not anymore. Nowadays it's way easier, right? You can just find a cloud instance uh, and, you know, point them to a GitHub repo and you're cooking, right? Um, it's a lot easier, a lot faster than it used to be, right? And running in the cloud is nice because that way other people can also see your uh, CIs and run a CI versus sometimes people have like a internal or private CI environment and Sometimes they run more exhaustive tests or in some cases they have secret tests because they involve secret IP. Sure, but uh, having a public cloud one really, really, really uh, gets things going. For a long time, I recommend a service called Travis. Unfortunately, they've kind of recently changed their business model and the code quality has really gone downhill. Uh, so I can only recommend them. However, uh, around the same time they declined, uh, GitHub Actions has really taken off. And so, since we already use GitHub for this course and stuff, uh, actions are free and easy to set up, so I would recommend those. And yeah, uh, for our kind of open source projects, uh, yeah, Actions is more insufficient to kind of get our things running, and their instances are great, it has stuff we need in them, and it, it's running. Um, yeah, reading back from the chat, I think the students also shared um, 
a few things. I'm going to kind of go through these one by one. Okay, so interesting anecdote. <coughs> the most popular open source project, Linux, doesn't do many of these things. So uh, that's true, right? And I think there's a few things to point out about Linux that are worth uh, acknowledging. Number one is that it's also, even though it's contemporary and being continuously updated and new, it's also old, right? It's from the early 90s, right? It's basically a 30-year-old piece of software. Um, and so a lot of these practices we're going to discuss are actually kind of more modern practices that, you know, weren't really around there. Additionally, some of these practices are kind of hard to scale to Linux scale, right? It's one thing to have, let's say, five or 10 internal developers, maybe, you know, 10 or 20 external contributors. It's another thing to have the tens of thousands of contributors Linux has, right? Um, and so, yeah, so Linux, of course, makes extremely reliable software a lot of us all count on. Uh, and so they also have processes that work to some extent. Um, but yeah, it's also kind of the most extreme, extreme case. Uh, and I actually believe the open source class taught by Professor Maltzan actually is specifically about some things involved in Linux. Um, in second, I saw a comment about, yeah, I think the Chisel CI template, sorry, Chisel template, you know, that repo you're supposed to use to create your own Chisel project fork has CI actions and they maybe weren't working, working right off the bat. Yeah, that'd be worth looking into. Um, it may probably just be a few line change to a YAML file somewhere. Uh, to set it up and we'll kind of see second that uh, what that might look like in just a moment um yeah so i forgot i think uh yeah so in one slide i'll be showing you uh, an example of this from a repo might kind of make it more clear um cool so so far in this course we've mostly been worried about testing our hardware designs right it's kind of been focused about okay yeah we have a you know harder block we're testing it and well our primary means of testing the hardware has been to write a scala functional model and then to co-stimulate the functional model with our, you know, chisel module and, you know, compare the two, right? And that's kind of been our testing. And sometimes we also have additional tests to test our Scala functional model. That's kind of what we've been doing for this course. And for the size of the projects we've been doing, I would argue that's sufficient. Uh, just last week, we had Kevin's wonderful talk and we learned about how to do formal verification with chisel. And I think that's super, super cool. You can definitely get to some, test some things much more concretely. It's our much more, you know, much more conviction and much more efficiently with some of the things he proposed. That's really, really exciting. Um, but there's still more types of testing out there, right? Um, and these, these make sense when you have larger projects, both either for code as hardware or code as software. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of go over a couple of these, just to kind of be, make you aware of the other types of things, other types of testing out there. So you may have heard the expression, you know, a unit test or unit test, right? So that tests a specific module function component in isolation, right? And so the nice part about unit tests is you want to make sure your components are correct. It's easier to kind of test them in isolation and see how they're doing. And if there is any, you know, issues or any bugs, it's kind of easier to debug and fix them at that level. So you, unit tests are kind of a great way to get started. But of course, that's, that's not everything. You don't just want components in isolation. You want them combined, right? So integration tests combines your components, whether it be code pieces or, you know, modules, whatever, and sees how they work together, right? And uh, I think a very interesting thing that comes up sometimes is very often people when they have a code base, they actually end up writing integration tests. They actually end up writing, you know, end-to-end -end tests. Oh, does my entire code base do the right thing all at once? And it's kind of all or nothing, right? Or if it's working, the test will tell you that. Great. And let's say it gets the wrong answer. And you're like, shoot, where do I even go to fix this, right? Because um, this is a big monolithic thing, right? Unit test is kind of a way to break that up, right? So, you know, you run both unit tests and integration tests. And, you know, let's say you have an integration test that fails. Well, you may go look and see which unit test also failed, right? And perhaps you'll see some unit tests fail. It tells you which units to go look into, perhaps to give a suggestion to how to fix the integration test, right? Um, and so you should have both types of product tests, right? And I think even within your project, right? You may have, you know, a module, let's say a sub-module deep inside of your components that can have unit tests. And then maybe you'll test a, a bigger module kind of includes that one. Maybe you'll test the interaction of a few modules together. Um, this is the integration test. Okay, those are kind of, you know, rough test granularities, you know, unit versus integration. Uh, then in terms of other types of tests, and these are kind of somewhat overlapping sometimes, uh, there's something called regression testing. And that is um, ensuring things that you thought works continue to work, right? So you may have heard the expression TDD or test-driven development. The idea, of course, being that um, rather than writing code first and then test second and then kind of making the tests match the code or, you know, double checking, actually writing the tests first, starting with failing tests because the things are implemented, and then, you know, writing your code until it passed the test, right? That's kind of, you know, a great best practice encouraged in the last 20 years. 
And um, so oftentimes tests precede the code, right? Uh, regression testing, these tests may have actually originally preceded the code, but the way to use now is for code that you believe works and the test showed it works. And you kind of run these tests to make sure you didn't break anything. Even though you're not actually changing this code, uh, you know, maybe it depends on other things. And so you want to uh, make sure things didn't get break. And so sometimes with regression testing, it's a matter of testing out the code, it's a matter of testing out the code in other contexts. So for example, you know, maybe your code base supports multiple compilers or different versions of your dependencies. You know, maybe your project works on both Scala 2.13 and Scala 2.12, for example. Um, and maybe day to day, you're constantly developing for 2.13. Having a you know CI that's running a rest test to compare against 2.12 is going to make sure that you didn't break 2.12 compatibility, right? Um, this you might hear the expression regression test. That's what that is. Uh, another phrase you may hear is something called a smoke test. Smoke the idea of a smoke test is supposed to be like a subset of tests. It's supposed to you know complete reasonably quickly, um, and it's a very very you know quick uh, sanity check, right? And so if something fails a smoke test, that means it's definitely broken. Uh, something's you know wrong. You should be suspicious. You should run more tests to figure out exactly what's wrong. Uh, something passes smoke test. It doesn't mean it's it's good. It just means it's not uh, egregiously on fire. Um, so why would you have these? Well, sometimes if you have a big project, running you know all of your tests, all of your regression combinations, that can take a day or more, right? And so for certain types of interactions, maybe you do a smoke test more frequently, and then you run these bigger tests, uh, you know, longer at other times, right? Um, and so finally, there's of course also performance tests, right? To make sure that, you know, are you reaching certain performance targets, right? And, um, this can be really hard to test sometimes, right? Because, uh, you know, normally we do performance testing for software to kind of make sure that this environment matches the environment, uh, you know, you expect your thing to be running on. And sometimes you're, you know, your testing server is heavily loaded. So if your testing server is heavily loaded, wouldn't that affect your performance results? Yeah, it can, it can be, it can be tricky. Uh, in our case, in hard design, it's a little bit easier, right? Where we want to make sure there's no regression in hard design metrics. So perhaps you may actually kick off uh, a run that, you know, will uh, run your design through a backend. And you will check to make sure you didn't horribly regress in any of your metrics, right? Someone may have made a small change they thought was innocuous. It didn't change the functionality, but oh my gosh, they made a much, much, much worse critical path. And now you no longer make timing, right? So you want to be aware of that. Um, and so, yeah, so these are kind of some broad levels of tests, right? But like I said, the bigger point of CI is make the tools do the work, right? You write the, you write the tests, that's your job. Um, but with CI, the tools are hopefully run these tests frequently, help you use them in ways that are very useful, right? And in terms of reducing effort to writing tests, some of the things with formal verification, like you saw last week, that can kind of let you sometimes more quickly get out of a certain aspect, rather than to kind of keep writing tests and imagining every possible combination and just writing tests and every possible combination. Gee, if you can formally prove some property holds, wow, that would be way better, right? And so, yeah, that can definitely be a way to kind of reduce that. It's a really exciting functionality. Um, and so, yeah, so when you're running your CI, especially as making tools that work, you'll have different modes, right? Sometimes you'll have, you know, shorter tests that kind of run on each commit or each time you, someone does a pull request and maybe you'll run longer tests uh, after you've done initial sandy check on a pull request and say, you know what, I want to see if this really doesn't break anything, maybe you run a longer test. Sometimes you do a very long, exhaustive test overnight, uh, once per day, whatever code's in your repo, rather than waiting for a specific commit, you just, you know, at 2 a.m., take the head of the branch and just, you know, push it through, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of things uh, kind of involved with this. So to kind of show this, uh, I was actually going to go ahead and use some tabs and give you some examples of this. So all quarter we've been using Chisel. Let's go ahead and look at how Chisel uh, does some of this stuff, right? So... Here we are at their GitHub page. And now, uh, you know, with regards to using tests to um, uh, demonstrate stuff, you can see, for example, uh, you know, this badge uh, is can automatically updated and shows the continuous integration is passing. That's that's a good sign, right? You also can see, for example, like in this, uh, you know, little reference about the commits, there's a green check, meaning that some amount of things were passing. If we look at the commit history, we can see that, you know, some amount of CI was run and it's been passing, right? So there's things that are um, working. Oh wait, uh oh, some things didn't weren't passing, right? So it's good to kind of be aware of that, and you kind of instantly draw your attention to those things. Okay, so here we are in a chill repo. repo. Uh, what can we see? Well, I'm actually going to start off by showing the original 
CI setup, which is actually no longer active. Uh, you can see that these things uh, are not original, but a prior one. Uh, you know, I haven't run in a year. This is using Circle CI, another testing service. Um, and I kind of want to show you is there's a lot of different uh, things going on here, right? So you can see, for example, that they were uh, testing, in this case, Chisel 3. And so you can see it kind of going through. And there's multiple steps for running one of these CI jobs. Uh, and you can see, for example, it's testing, uh, in this case, Chisel against Scala 2.11 and Scala 2.12, kind of doing a little bit of a regression check there. Uh, and even before you run the test, you kind of need to build all the code you're trying to combine. But the reason why I kind of pulled this in is you can see, you know, things like, oh, yes, you know, in this case, something failed. Uh, you know, tests don't always pass. That's kind of why you're running them, right? Sometimes you fail early on. You can't even move forward. Uh, in this case, you know, uh, there was a regression for 2.11, but it seems perhaps maybe to work for 2.12. Um, and you can kind of see that. Okay, so that was an older one. I like kind of showing this because I think this is kind of a pretty UI, but uh, currently they're using uh, not that. They're using uh, GitHub Actions, right? So GitHub Actions, you can see the most recent things that runs, and these are run, you know, in the last uh, day. And you can see, oh man, wow, some of these things are not passing too often, right? Um, but let's see, okay, if we click on one of these, you know, it does seem to be passing. Uh, so what was it doing? Well, it was doing multiple jobs. So you actually can have a dependence graph and kind of pull them all out, right? And so you can kind of see what they're doing. Uh, and it's so, okay. So in this case, what are we doing? Okay, a bunch of steps, setting up the environment, and then there's the actual test. You see some, you know, warnings in the compiler and it's building stuff, but it's now compiling stuff that actually looks like compiling Verilator. Um, and then it's going to run for a while, but you kind of get the point. The point is this is running on a cloud instance provided by GitHub Actions. Uh, and this was set up without a whole lot of work, right? Um, and so that's cool, right? So this is kind of running. You can kind of see when things are running. And, uh, you know, in this case, this is looking at it from the point of view of the CI. When was CI invoked? But remember, CI is going to be invoked whenever you set up a trigger. And the trigger could be someone pushing a commit. Could be someone opening a pull request. Or it could be just a button you want to push when you want to request the CI to run. Um, in terms of how this was set up, uh, this is that YAML file I was referring to. So for GitHub Actions, you know, the, the path to it should be, you know, dot GitHub workflows and there you can go. This is a super complicated one. This is one for, you know, the chill repo. So it's much longer than yours is going to be. Yours is going to be a small fraction of this. But you can kind of see what it is in here, right? So this configuration file, you, uh, you know, kind of tell us some certain things. You might pick out which uh, instance to use for testing, in this case using Ubuntu 20.04. Um, maybe even you can be very careful about which features you're using um, and which versions. Um, and you can see, oh yeah, we're also going to actually pull in, this is actually a bunch of binary tools from uh, Yosis uh, and a lot of stuff. But the point is, okay, it sets everything up and then at some point it's going to start running things. Okay, so that's actually still um, doing some early stuff, right? Uh, but then when it actually comes time to do the test, right? We're actually calling, you know, SPT uh, test, right? Um, and then you can see there's a variety of other things going on here. One small detail, which won't affect us, but it comes from other open source repos, is sometimes they, um, because these are public repos, you don't want to put certain, you know, passwords or keys into, uh, you know, public available repos. So you have to instead uh, use these kind of placeholder variables and then do some of this, you know, uh, key passing under a table, some uh, preset variables, whatever. Um, but this kind of gives you uh, a sense for it. So maybe I'll pause here for any questions on CI before we move on. Or maybe comments. People have maybe experiences they want to share. Okay, well, we can go on to uh, the next uh Topic, right? So, uh, code management, right? I think this is one perhaps many of you are familiar with, uh, but I also can kind of sprinkle in some of my own uh, personal opinions here to help make this maybe a little bit more interesting, right? So, uh, for version control and code management, uh, you know, we're using Git all quarter. You're probably all very familiar with it. Um, it's obviously, you know, a complete essential thing these days. Uh, I can tell you old war stories. You know, I started off using things like CVS or SVN and Whatever you don't like about Git, trust me, Git is better than those things. Um, and so uh, what's interesting about Git, though, is there's kind of some artistic choice or, you know, pragmatic choices 
about how to actually structure or arrange your, your, your project amongst Git or repositories or perhaps multiple repositories, right? And so um, one really nice functionality I think perhaps is not always appreciated, something called that Git submodule, which allows you within your Git repo to point to another Git repo and not just point to another repo, but actually a specific commit. So when you pull in that submodule, you don't just get whatever code happens to be on head or branch or whatever, you actually get that specific commit you want, right? Um, and so sometimes people have a project where they have many sub pieces and they give them all their own repos and then they have a you know top level repo which has you know like 10 sub modules. Uh, from personal experience, uh, I mean that always be the best. Uh, I recommend only using sub modules. So these are things that really can be used independently and should be distributed separately, right? It's okay to have a, a repo so people use and maybe only use one folder out of the five folders in there. If it doesn't require you know arcane dependencies for each folder, right? But if it's really a case where yeah these things should really be separately distributed, separately version controlled, fine. You can put them in different repos and submodule it. But um, uh, there's been a push you know for quite a few years now. It's called a mono repo, and that is just putting everything into a single big repo when possible. Uh, you know a good example is something called Rocket Chip. You know the largest you know chisel design is public. Originally it had like you know quite a few submodules, and now uh, it's down to a couple, right? I don't know, there might be a couple left still, but it used to be quite a few, right? And they pulled a lot of code in there many years ago. And then things like uh, Fertile and, you know, um, Chisel, they can now also encourage folks to um, use uh, jar installs, right? So that's nice. Um, so what should you use the submodule for? It's actually really good if you have a external dependence that's unversioned, right? So somebody who just, you know, has a Git repo you like, yeah. Submodule that. It's a good reason why you should do that. Make sure you're using the right version. Um, in terms of more Git uh, advice, uh, it's really easy to get excited about branches and have a lot of branches. Uh, I'm a big fan of um, only maintaining a few long lived Git branches, right? Maybe you have like a, a, a master or a main, and maybe you have like a, a dev or a next version branch. But otherwise, you know, try to avoid prevent yourself from having too many branches. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes you have a small branch that you use to develop uh, a feature and then let's say that branch is successful and you end up, you know, merging, rebasing that feature into your mainline code. You can delete that branch, right? Be done with it, right? Um, otherwise it's kind of all stuff happening there. Um, and then you like pull a repo and it has, you know, 500 branches and let's say 490 of them are stale. Yeah. I don't know if there's any benefit to that. It's kind of, uh, a mess. Yeah. How many branches does Chisel have? Chisel, I think has 200 branches. I don't think they aggressively prune the rolled branches. Um, and yeah, I, I personally, I, I would if I could. <laughs> but I'm also a neat freak sometimes. Um, and then uh, finally, I, you may have heard something called a pull request or PR for short. It's a way on a place like GitHub, someone can uh, you know contribute code to your repository. Uh, and so what that really is, is kind of tear that apart for a second, right? A pull is the way you know you bring code from another repo Right, and so a pull request is you telling someone on their repo, "Hey, I have my repo, which probably is a fork or copy of your code. I want you to pull my code into your repo." Right, so that's what a pull request or PR is. Right, and uh, as someone that runs a repo, you can choose whether or not to accept these contributions, uh, and you can also, you know, give feedback and review and revise before accepting. So we'll talk about code re review in just, uh, a few minutes. Actually, if you go forward to the Chisel uh, re uh, repo, we can kind of see some things happening here. Yeah, we can see right now, for example, there is. 86 open pull requests. Now, one thing that's perhaps interesting worth noting is that pull requests don't need to come from the outside. They can come from internal processes. A lot of organizations decide that the way they want to develop is to anything on this major serious branch needs to come in via pull requests, anything on master or main. And so thus, uh, even the internal developers must open pull requests to go through review in order to get things added to those branches. Other times worth noting that sometimes pull requests don't even come from humans. <laughs> Make tools do the work, right? So for example, uh, you know, you can have bots to go ahead and recognize certain things you want to do and will uh, do various things, right? So in this case, you know, this is updating a dependence automatically and by having this kind of explicit, you kind of make sure it's, uh, you know, not breaking anything. Um, if you watched the video from when uh, Jack Koenig visited us last spring, he talks about uh, how they maintain uh, multiple version branches and they can use automated tools to backport commits, right? So, you know, 
if you have you know like your, your current version, the future version, maybe a path version you're still supporting, and some of the bug fix you want to be applied to all those code bases, you can use tools to automatically kind of do that, you know, porting and backporting. Um, and so actually, if you look at the closed ones, you'll see the tags automatically added for things that were backported. Um, so cool. Okay. And so let's talk a little about code review, right? So I kind of been trying to repeat throughout this quarter, um, just getting working code the first time maybe isn't enough, right? It's also worth trying to, you know, make nice code, right? And like I said, it's hard to get that right the first time. You need to kind of revise it. And uh, if you haven't gone through this experience, uh, hopefully you can sometime soon of having a, a real code review, right? Where um, for me, it was a very, you know, poignant experience, but it was good, right? Where like I, you know, had code, I had to go to code review in order to get it, you know, uh, merged into a code base. This was my first, uh, one, of my, one of my first industrial internships. And uh, they basically marked up every single line of my code uh, even though none of it was wrong, right? None of it did the wrong thing. None of it broke an API or an abstraction or produced the wrong answer. They just kind of showed me ways to do things a lot nicer, right? Uh, and that was helpful. That's good. Um, like I said, think about when you're writing, right? That like uh, when you're writing text, sometimes we have situations where we have to write you know, everything all at once in one long night or something, but that's usually not going to be that great, right? The things people write that are you know good and worth reading usually are the result of quite a bit of revision and quite a bit of even rewriting, right? And so just because the content's there, that's not enough, right? You actually want to, you know, improve the flow. You want to make it readable and clear and label it and restructure things. And you know what? This thing should go better here. You kind of reorder it, right? And to do that, a really good job at that, right? Your own opinions are helpful, but better yet, you get feedback, right? You get people you trust and you get feedback from people you trust to make that better, right? And so this is something I think a lot of you maybe you have done in the past for, for writing, or you know, know what you should do this for writing. Um, and yet we don't do that very often for code, right? Especially in the academic environment when you're you know, turning in course projects, you know you are trying to pass tests and then once you pass the tests, up, oh, I'm done. Next homework, you know, new, new week, new homework assignment, and you're moving on, right? And so uh, working with the same code and trying to keep improving it and cleaning up is a really good experience. And hopefully with the project in this course, you get a little bit of that taste of that, right? We're quite, we had that deadline on Monday. I encourage you to kind of get uh, a lot of functionality done early, so that way you have a chance to kind of revise and improve, right? Um, that's the point. If you just kind of get the code working once and walk away from it, it's bound to have weirdness in there, right? We all do certain things to get the work the first time, and that's okay. You got the work the first time, but then you got to go in and clean it up, right? And uh, when you're trying to clean it up, you can do a good job yourself, but at some point you're kind of be like, hmm, I, I don't know what else to do, right? A code review from another person is a good way to try to... Uh, figure out what else you should do. So uh, code reviews are great, right? I, I really recommend you doing it if you haven't done one already. You might even arrange to do one with your partner in your project. Perhaps you are pair programming. That is, you know, you're writing the same code together at times, but maybe there's times you can write certain portions separately and you can review each other's code and talk it over. Like, hey, what are you doing here? Or does this make sense? Or maybe you can do this differently, right? And so really code reviews kind of have two big benefits. Not only to help improve your code you're reviewing, they help both sides uh, learn more about coding, right? Both the reviewer and reviewee uh, get to see things, right? The reviewer, uh, sorry, the reviewee, of course, gets told places in their code, maybe it's unclear, or they may be suggested APIs or functions they weren't aware of, you know, oh yeah, you can use, you know, dot is empty or something, right? You know, those kind of things. Um, but also sometimes the reviewer reads someone else's code and it's like, oh wait, that's clever. That's a cool way of doing that. That's a nice way of doing that. And you can learn. So. Getting that kind of additional code fluency is a great thing to do, and code review is a great way to kind of do that, right? Um, another nice thing about code reviews, hopefully, is sometimes you can kind of improve code consistency. Uh, when you have a large shared open source code base, uh, one thing you should strive to do is to kind of be selfless in a way, in, in that uh, if someone's scrolling through the code, it shouldn't be apparent who read it unless they look at the commit history, right? Uh, you don't want someone to be like, oh my gosh, there's so-and-so's code versus here's so-and-so's code. Like, that's not what you want, right? That's not a very integrated, homogenous project. You want to have a read upon style. Let's say you somehow fight about the tabs versus spaces battle. You figure out, you know, the indent size battle. You have all those battles. You agree on stuff. But even beyond that, just being consistent of how you name things, how you access certain things, how you 
And so code review is a way to kind of improve that consistency because you have multiple parties kind of, you know, talking it over. Like, you know what? I don't just do things my own way in my own little vacuum, you know, here's the way I do things. And they review it. Oh, well, yeah, let's make sure it's the same way. And then when they write it, they kind of write it the same way. It's a great way to kind of improve consistency across things, right? Um, sometimes, you know, uh, people, when they know they're going to be reviewed, of course, or a little, a little bit of, you know, uh, their pride at stake. And so thus they do a better job cleaning up the code in advance, which is good, right? That's a good feature. And like I said, um, you'd be surprised how much you can learn about just coding and making readable code by both reading other people's code as well as having your code re reviewed. Um, so I think it's a really valuable thing if you haven't had that experience. And for some, maybe some of you are going to go off and intern in industry. Yeah, so if you can't get a code review uh, there. Um, cool. So what might a code review look like? Well, usually um, these steps can vary depending on organization and the actual review, but this is a high-level overview, right? So in that process, someone's going to, you know, hey, say, hey, I want this code to be reviewed. Um, and, you know, they're probably going to maybe try and add code, maybe open a pull request. Uh, you know, it's like I said, some projects won't let you push code directly to the main branch. You have to instead open a pull request and it needs to be reviewed and then pulled in, right? And you actually make that explicit rule inside the repository settings. So that way, like, is this force? Is a rule, right? Um, so after you kind of make this review request, the reviewer is going to take time to review the code and look it over and uh, even things like GitHub have nice uh, APIs for you to kind of annotate lines of code and make suggestions. Um, you know, maybe use things like Perforce uh, and other organizations. Uh, you can do stuff like this. And you can go in and uh, do this kind of stuff. Um, and then following the code review, which may or may not have a uh, interactive portion, right? So, so it may just be, you know, completely offline where uh, the person submits code, it's reviewed asynchronously, and they look at the feedback asynchronously. Sometimes maybe you have a brief, you know, synchronous meeting to, you know, sync up and make sure it makes sense and kind of talk things out. But I think a lot of organizations will encourage you to do it asynchronously, not just because it's easier to not schedule meetings, but also that way there's a log of the uh, things you discussed, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, the submitter is going to, you know, based on the code review, they're going to change their code and revise and they'll submit for review. And it may take multiple rounds of review. Um, they may uh, decide, um, you know what, you fixed this, that's better, but you know what's the other thing I didn't see the first time or whatever, so you may do multiple rounds, right? And essentially at some point, uh, there's gonna be reviewers says, you know what, uh, this is good. Uh, you see that key phrase LGTM or looks good to me and it's approved and then somehow it gets you know, merged or accepted somehow. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe I'll do this slide before going on to the example from Chisel. Um, so let's say you and your partner decide to do a code review. What kind of things should you be looking for? Uh, well, usually organizations have a checklist internally for things they want people to check in code reviews. It's not just a, a mystery or a you know, thing you have to figure out on your own. But the kind of things you check for, number one, is correctness, right? Is, hey, did this thing pass the eye, right? If, you, if you're doing a code review and a thing doesn't pass the eye, you should be like, hey, um, uh, maybe we should, you know, uh, you should fix that first. Uh, or, you know, maybe it passed smoke test, really lightweight test, and maybe you aren't sure about it, so you actually go ahead and run a more heavyweight test on it or run a regression test to make sure it doesn't break anything, right? Um, and then worse yet, maybe when you're reading the code and you may have some awareness of the code they're changing, you're like, oh, shucks, the thing they're changing maybe can reduce a really subtle thing and actually you're not even testing for this and maybe just cause you to think you need more tests. So... Number one, of course, you want to make sure you aren't pulling code in that's going to be incorrect, right? Then, then it's the one that said the things people overlook, it's hard to do on your own, is this readability code style thing, making sure this code is clear, right? Like I said, in your organization, you're going to develop your own style and conventions to make sure you're kind of consistent in that way, follow naming conventions, etc. But then, you know, uh, actually talk about style, right? So, you know, is it better to break up this long, complex line into multiple lines? Or sometimes people do that too much and you have, you know, 10 lines when really should just kind of embed it into one line, right? So I've seen people argue both ways with the kinds of things. There's a little bit of a uh, way to kind of go about that. For the code formatting, code formatting things, there's tools like Scala Style, which is a, a linter that kind of checks the syntax for you. Uh, sorry, checks the uh, compliance to rules you define. Um, so that's the kind of things. Okay, so number one, checking correctness. Number two, checking readability, code style. Number three is completeness, right? Um, 
if someone's you know adding new functionality, they better be adding tests for that new functionality, right? Or if someone tells you this is a bug fix, they should be submitting a test that showed the original code was broken and now it's fixed, right? Or perhaps what they're doing needs to be documented, right? So make sure it's there. Um, and so, yeah, and also maybe you're looking at this code review and you know what? It meets all these checkboxes, but you as a uh, maintainer of this repository are like, oh, shucks, this thing is going to provide a functionality that maybe we don't think is in the scope for our project. And this is going to cause a lot of conflict or a lot of future headaches, right? Maybe you just, despite it passing all these things, you're still going to say no. Um, that may happen, but uh, this kind of covers that. Does anyone have any questions or comments for code reviews they want to share before I go show the Google, oh, sorry, the Chisel examples? Okay, um, so if we go through our tabs here, we can kind of see some of these other, um, oops. We can see some of these other uh, ones. So for example, um, Oh, so that was just the CI. I had a, a PR pulled out. Where did it go? There it is. Um, yeah, so this is a pull request that was closed recently because uh, it was merged, right? So let's go ahead and see what happened here, right? So this actually was our speaker from uh, last week, uh, Kevin. And uh, he submitted code to actually add that gray code as a util function to the chill library. So we saw in that his lecture, you know, here is a gray code thing. So what happens? Well, in the pull request, uh, all this kind of stuff here, it's actually is from a template. So I'm getting some of a template so that way people kind of uh, answer these kind of questions you want to see. And, you know, once again, make tools do the work, automate things whenever you can automate. So you can see uh, he requested review and he selected people to punch to review it. Um, they did a few changes to the code, uh, you know, and here's the response from uh, reviewers. Okay. There's some commentary here from one of the reviewers. Uh, another reviewer uh, looked at it and you can see here's an example of how they actually were able to kind of reference the code and actually um, make suggestions. So they didn't just point to a place of code and say, you know what, hey, if you make this change, in this case, using a, a Scala literal router and a chisel literal, they believe it makes it easy to go faster. That's exciting. Uh, so as a result, you know, the person, uh, Kevin revised, says he made a new commit to kind of uh, check this, right? And then um, the uh, reviewer uh, approved it, right? So they hit the approval button, also gave you that wonderful, you know, looks good to me uh, thing. And then there's additional conversation. Do you want to backport this to prior versions? And his answer is, you know, why not? And then they use the bots to backport this to um, other versions. So that's kind of a little bit of a thing here. You can kind of see example of the code review in practice. Um, this was a very short bit of code and a very short review. Uh, sometimes there's a lot more conversation. Uh, this is the kind of important thing. You want to be respectful and polite when you're addressing things. You don't want to, you know, attack somebody or attack their code, but you also do kind of want to get various things across and you can see it's a learning experience for both parties. Cool. Um, great. Other questions. Cool. Okay. So, um, one other thing they talk about is documentation, right? I think everyone always kind of has this sentiment that oh, documentation is, you know, important, but, you know, I don't want to write it or whatever. Um, it's definitely important, right? And uh, people often complain that their open source code isn't adopted or no one contributes to it. Uh, lack of documentation is a really, really, really common reason why. <laughs> and I'll take that a step further. Let's say you have a project that uh, you're working on and you want it to be open source and adopted. But initially, maybe you want to, uh, maybe you want to keep it secret, but you're lazy and you want to use a public repo. Guess what? If you have a undocumented repo on GitHub that's, you know, just out there public, nobody cares. <laughs> like that thing just exists and you could have like code and could, you know, derive brand new Bitcoins out of thin air, right? It would, people would not know, right? Because um, it's not documented, right? And so, uh Documentation is really, really important if you want your thing to be used. Um, and so it's not just about telling people how to use your tool. Uh, it's also telling them what the tool does. I get to the number of times I come across the repo on GitHub where you come across it and you got linked to this repo with something and you're just trying to figure out what it does, right? And so you scroll down to the readme and the readme starts listing off 
dependencies to install or how to install the thing. And you're still wondering like what the, what does this thing even do? Like what tech does this package do? And you go click on the organization it's hosted in and it's the organization it's hosted in is, oh yes, this is the organization for the blank project. And it's like, what does the blank project do, right? Like, um, you remember that people don't always come from certain contexts. You have a very good, you know, job of orienting people, give a very, very broad, very, very accessible way of kind of saying what you're doing and summarizing what it does. Why does this thing exist? What should people use this for? And then you go into how to use it. Interestingly, you may also want to document the internal structure, right? Uh, and uh, this is a way to kind of make it easy for others to extend or contribute back to your code. So I said before, you know, lacking documentation really is going to mostly hurt potential users, right? If you're the person who wrote this code, you kind of know it's there. You kind of know it's how to use it. Um, but it's also kind of keeping your project to the scope of a single person or a couple people, right? If you want to have a lot of contributors, even if they're on the same organization, you even need documentation just for each other, right? So um, lacking documentation really harms adoption or even contributions, right? It's been hurt both. Um, so good documents, uh, not only, you know, makes it easy for using contributors to find and use uh, your, your code, um, but also it forces you to think from a user perspective of why do certain things exist or how should I express this, right? Sometimes people kind of, you know, write an API and they don't quite think about enough how it's going to be used. Uh, you know, for example, maybe you're making a chisel generator like in this class for your project and maybe you should spend a little bit of time thinking about how might this be used inside of a larger, you know, project or hardware design and how should I change the interface or what makes sense, right? And so sometimes documentation is a good way to kind of force that thought process, right? And think about, oh, how does this go? Maybe I need to rethink this interface or, you know what, if something is hard to explain, you should be asking yourself a couple questions. Number one, do I need to explain this, right? Is this a detail of the internals that maybe doesn't need to be exposed? Instead, maybe I should, you know, provide the abstraction and be done with it, or maybe I should rethink how I structure my project or I'm presenting it. Um, in terms of tools that are relevant for us using, you know, Chisel open source projects, um, the bare, 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 bare minimum is a readme file. We ask you to do that for the project. Um, and so what's the readme file? Yeah, it's just the file inside the repo. GitHub automatically renders these. So that's why it's kind of nice. Um, and it's a single file, easy to write and maintain. You can use Markdown to get some formatting in there. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's kind of bare minimum, right? So you should definitely in there cover things like what tech does this do, uh, how to use it, and maybe anything else you think is important. Um, another thing you've seen this quarter, of course, is Scala doc, right? So like Java doc or things like it, you know, you can uh, put your documentation directly into the code and thus you can document APIs. And this is really, really cool and nice because um, one of the challenges of documentation is keeping it up to date. This so is very often you have documentation in a different place and people change the code and they forget to change the documentation. Hopefully your code reviewers will, will complain about this, but you know, maybe they'll forget. Scaladoc by putting like documentation right next to the code, hopefully you, know, you reduce the odds of that happening. Uh, and you know, so Scaladoc of course you write comments in a special way inside the files. The, you run a tool to actually generate HTML, which you can view in the web. Some IDs actually can read Scaladoc and you know, render it prettily uh, inline. Uh, so hopefully it works pretty well. And the third option is to go ahead and write full on separate documentation. Um, this is great when you want to kind of explain things and actually you've been using these two as well for Chisel for the top explanations, right? So this, a tool called read the docs is a great way to kind of host these and write these, but that's not the only way to do it. You can do it on your own. So let's go ahead and peek at some of these examples maybe in the Chisel world. So if we pull this down, um, so let's say, so here, for example, we've seen, you know, this is the Scala doc on the Arbiter, right? In the Chisel library. So, you know, uh, you can see an example and someone wrote what it does. Um, a lot of stuff is actually populated on Mac, but it's reading the source code, right? It's able to kind of read the fields that are public, et cetera. Um, now, if we go look at how this actually is written, uh, we can see uh, that, you know, for example, uh, it's, this is the kind of interpretation you would do for Scala doc, right? Where you're uh, kind of indicating various things. And, you know, when this is run, it kind of all comes together. Now for the example, for the topic oriented explanations, we've seen these nice things, uh, you know, where we have this uh, cookbook and other things like this, kind of see these nice rendered pages. These actually came originally from Markdown files, which uh, were compiled by a tool called MDoc. 
But you can see once again, you can write uh, things nice in Markdown. You can, you know, use cool formatting things. You can even tell it it's in Scala. It'll do the pretty rendering for Scala, right? Uh, a nice feature about um, uh, MDoc is actually you can even try to execute certain things for you to make sure they actually are correct. Uh, you don't have documentation that has bad code snippets, right? Which is handy. Um, so that's cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that was all I had for documentation. Let's see if I have anything else before I move on. Oh, uh, and then uh, for documentation, my concluding thoughts were mostly about um, advice. Like I said, for me, my, my, one of my biggest pet peeves is people don't often zoom out enough when explaining something. They kind of dive into details. And yes, you wrote this, you know the details, but uh, understand, you know, I'm not even a user yet. I'm just trying to understand what Hacker Thing even does. So really give a brief summary from a very wide, you know, accessible to a very wide audience about what you're doing, what your purpose is. Um, when people tend to write documentation, they kind of tend to think bottom up, you know, oh, this block does this, this block does this, this block plugs into this block. And uh, some people may find that helpful. A lot of your users kind of are more um, top down. They kind of want to know, okay, what's the purpose of this repo? Okay, what's the purpose of this feature, right? So kind of think more about what some of these purposes, kind of more top down rather than internally how it works. Um, and I'd also recommend emphasizing interactive things rather than uh, just trying to explain a bunch of abstractions. People sometimes start by going into a class hierarchy diagram and explaining abstractions and um, under the assumption that the user is going to read your documentation start to finish. That's not often the case, right? Usually people have a zillion things to do and your package is one of the many things they're using. Uh, really just kind of get to the key points. What's the purpose? Here's an example interaction and move on, right? Um, cool. Any documentation stories or questions from the audience? Okay, well, let's move on. And so finally, open sourcing, right? Uh, and so many of you may already be familiar with open source. I'm hoping to uh, catch everyone up. And I'm also hoping to kind of get you excited about open sourcing your, your own work, not just in general, but also hopefully your projects for this course, right? So what are the classic reasons why people open source? Number one is you hope your code helps people, right? Uh, you know, if you aren't trying to make money off it directly, um, and your code is something useful, you should be trying to get out there. And especially as you know, in our case, most of us are, you know, many of you are grad students or in my case, faculty member here are as researchers working for the University of California. We're often sponsored by some form of government funding, with the goal of helping society, right? So we should be open sourcing our work. And usually for you see, it's actually rules you need to open source certain things, right? And so um, get stuff out there, make people's lives easier, right? Um, and uh, you'd be surprised how often even companies now open source because they realize, you know what, this particular thing we're doing, uh, we're paying to get developed, but it's not a competitive, um, it's not a competitive advantage for us to actually release this, right? You know, for example, Facebook is famous where they actually open source their hardware designs with the Open Compute Project, you know, now, what, 10 years ago, right? Where they're saying, you know what, we're Facebook, our values are social network data, it's not data centers. We're gonna open source all of our stuff and hopefully this can, you know, help the community, but also help us, right? If you guys use our stuff, it'll get cheaper for them. Um, that's a good question from the chat as, you know, why isn't all publicly funded research open sourced? Uh, it should be. Uh, in many cases it is, but I don't know if it's always a verification and outright requirement, right? I think sometimes there's a little bit of a concern about um, when something can be patented or something. Uh, patents and open source are, you know, orthogonal topics. Um, we'll come to that in just a minute. Uh, so, okay, so number one, you can help people releasing your code. Number two, people in the community can help you. It's actually impressive when you release code and then all of a sudden someone sends you a bug fix. And it's like, I didn't even know I had a bug and they found it and fixed it. That's great. That's cool, right? That's a great way to get a productivity multiplier, right? We said make the tools do the work, that's one thing. Benefit from the community helping you back, that's another thing, right? And so like I've released code and you know, I thought it was it's a reasonably good code and people found bugs and fixed it, that's great. In some cases, they actually even did major contributions that like dramatically improved it and they pushed it back. And like, that's really nice. That's cool, right? And so community can help can really help kind of boost your code, right? Um, did you maybe try and go from altruistic to selfish motivations? Uh, contributing open source can help raise your profile, right? 
Uh, a lot of people have GitHubs on their grad school applications or, or their job resume or, you know, their resumes for applying for jobs. It'd be great if it actually had repos that were things other than, you know, homework four from some class you took, right? Um, that really shows you have kind of, you know, a strong coding background and better yet, if your code is actually being adopted, that's even, that's even better, right? Um, and so, yeah, that's a great way to kind of get your name out there, brand, et cetera. And then finally, it's kind of just, why not? I think people kind of have sometimes this initial, you know, apprehension about, oh my gosh, I might be judged by my code if it's not perfect, or I might, you know, someone might steal my idea or something like that. And then you realize that a lot of things aren't really that bad or actually aren't bad at all, right? For example, someone might take my ideas, right? Um, there's some concern to that, but also as a researcher, your goal is to make things of use to the world, right? So if someone adopts your ideas, that's good, right? Now, if they, of course, take your ideas and put their name on it and not your name, eh, maybe that's not great, right? But you, you do want people to use your things, right? So if it's all locked up in secret, it's not going to be able to be used, right? You do want to open source. You do want to get it out there. Um, and yeah, as long as you're not going to, you know, violate some sort of patent or ruin some company, you should try and open source it, right? So I think people should kind of get this mindset of, you know, having things open source and then kind of have to make the case of why it's closed source rather than the way around of why it should be open source. No, no, it should be open source. You need to kind of make a strong case for why it's closed source. That's kind of what I'm arguing. Um, cool. Um, so what do I think makes a good open source project? This is subjective, of course, but number one, needs to be something useful, right? <laughs> Otherwise, why does it exist? It needs to be correct. And in order to show that, it needs to have tests. People need to know it's tests. It needs to be documented. You need to have some publicity to it, right? People need to be aware it's out there. Maybe you get, you know, blow up on Twitter or something. Um, and it needs to have an open source license. And so that's what this next thing is going to be about is, let's talk about licensing a little bit. So uh, whenever you create something, especially in the United States, uh, you know, it could be code or, or something, you automatically get the copyright to it. This is something you made. This is yours. You've copyright to it. Now, since you own the copyright, that restricts other people's ability to do things with it. And I think this is one interesting misconception is people sometimes worry that, you know, oh, if I post my code online and haven't created a license file yet, uh, that means there's no license and people do whatever the heck they want with it. No, false, very false. Exact opposite is true. They don't have permission to do anything to it because it is still copyrighted by you even though you didn't assert it. Uh, and they have permission to do nothing, right? So um, when you create something, it's, there is a copyright. Uh, normally you get it. However, if the thing you create is creating scope of your employment, very often when you s s work someplace, you sign an IP agreement and actually guess what? Your employer gets the uh, copyright, right? So for example, uh, you know, I had to sign this form when I came to University of California that if I create something as part of my job as a professor, UC gets it, right? And actually many graduate students as part of the employment contracts when they sign up for a GSR, they have to sign a similar contract, right? So guess what? Yeah, we're doing things with research grants, research, university resources, yeah. University is going to get that copyright. So basically the default is actually the thing's closed, right? In the sense that people can't use it, right? And so in order for people to actually be able to use it, you need to license it, right? And license grants people permission to actually use something under certain conditions. License kind of describing under what conditions can be used, right? And so different licenses will have different ways of you know, permitting or restricting certain things. And so actually if you want open source code, just putting it online is enough. You actually need to put a license in there so people actually have permission to use it, right? And so license kind of specifies and clarifies what people have permission to do. So uh, in terms of the features of these open source licenses, uh, there's quite a few of them out there and never kind of has their own favorite ones. There's different trade-offs and different features. Um, and so there's a lot of different nuances to them, but there's some standard ones. Most people allow some sort of use, right? The question is, you know, what kind of use, what kind of modification? The, the most common things that are big discussion points are, you know, if you license it out there, are people allowed to use this code for commercial purposes? Maybe you as a researcher have people using it for free, but you don't want some making money off this. You want, if you're making money off this, they should maybe be giving you money too or something. Um, or the very common one is, you know, this notion of if you put code out there, if someone changes it, are they allowed to keep those changes themselves? Or are they required to distribute those changes, right? Um, additionally, you know, if someone uses your code, are they or are they not allowed to use your branding, right? So, uh, you know, for example, Chisel uh, was created uh, originally by UC Berkeley students, right? And so 
if I use Chisel, am I allowed to use UC Berkeley to endorse my project? And the answer is no, the Chisel license does not <laughs> uh, allow people to use the, the, the branding or trademarking of it to endorse it. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, the last one, which actually when it comes up a lot recently is even though you may be allowed to use the code, uh, the code may be using uh, patented processes that uh, may not be otherwise allowed. They may actually have, you know, patents filed. And if you want to use that patented process with that code, or even if you wrote your own code to do the exact same operation, you would need to pay some money for that. And so uh, that's called a patent grant, grant if the license actually doesn't just give you permission to use the code, but also uh, permission to use any grants used within it if the person that owns the code also owns the patent, right? They can't give you permission to use someone else's patent. That's, that's not possible, but for their own patent. Um, cool. So uh, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but these are some common licenses you might see out there. Uh, both uh, BSD and MIT are kind of very class licenses. You know, uh, the B is for Berkeley. The MIT is, of course, from the university. You know, class of academic projects, they're very permissive. Um, you kind of put stuff out there and people can use it basically whatever they want. They can use it commercially. They're not required to submit uh, post changes. Uh, these are great for researchers. Uh, usually UC encourages you to do uh, BSD, um, et cetera. Then GPL is kind of the, the big contrast, which is really big for a lot of open source projects. This is kind of open source zealous they're really excited about. The big sticking point is copy left. So if you change it, uh, you have to release the changes. And sometimes companies are so afraid of this that they prohibit their employees from using GPL code. So uh, a lot of times when we have ruled, no GPL code using our projects, no GPL dependencies. Uh, and so that really kind of restricts things. That's why BSD is sometimes much more appreciated by industry. Uh, then there's Apache, which is really similar to BSD and MIT from the permissiveness, but the difference is includes that patent grant, right? So like I said a second ago, if you have this large code base, sure your permission to use that code, but that code may inadvertently or intentionally include patents or patented processes. And even though you're using the code legitimately, you still could be sued for patent infringement, right? And so with a patent grant, you're saying, yes, you're allowed to uh, you know, use this code as well as any patents or same organization holds that pertain to this code in the manner this code uses them, right? You can't just, you know, use a patent grant, use a patent, something totally different, but in that case, you can. Um, like I said, uh, this comes up. And then there is the things like unlicensed or the WTF uh, permissive license, right? So these are ones basically saying, I don't care. I really am just putting this code online for you to do whatever heck you want in any way, shape or form. Uh, and so you kind of can figure out what these make sense for you, right? Cool. Um, and so in terms of what should you put or where to put your license? So once you've picked your license, you make it prominent. You should have a license file on your root directory. Uh, GitHub actually can detect this and flag this for you automatically. There's also the standard called SPDX, where you can kind of put a comment on top of a line of your code to tell people what it is. So that way there's like automated tools that can crawl large code repositories to find license contained in there and see who owns what. That's really helpful. So let's go ahead and peek at some of this stuff. So for example, if we look at, um, we really get an arbiter, you can see here's the SPDX tag, saying this is Apache 2.0. And if we go back to like the chisel main uh, thing we can see, for example, that yeah, hey, this is Chisel. Uh, GitHub automatically detected it has Apache 2.0 as license. So we click on this, it takes us to the file, which is the license file, right? See, so Chisel 3 license. And you see, oh, yes, here's Apache, here are the permissions, here are the limitations, etc. Cool. And then uh, this is a final closing thing. Um, if you want to have an open source project and you want to get real traction, you need not just users, but also contributors, right? And so uh, this is one thing that's kind of a little bit subtle, but I think people, a lot of it seems like common sense, but a lot of projects don't do this and they surprise, well, why don't everyone contribute to my code? Number one, your code is be interesting and useful, right? If your code's not solving a problem other people are doing, they're not even looking for it, right? You need testing. Without testing, you cannot have external contributors. Um, you have documentation, so you know how to get in there. And also you need response to the community, right? If someone opens up an issue or a pull request on GitHub and you don't touch it for two months, and then they come to your repository and you see a bunch of you know, ignored issues from the last six months, they're gonna assume it's a dead project, right? So you need to be very prompt to respond to these, respond to these in a nice, polite way and be prompt, right? Show your responsive. And also additionally, we have uh, other community interaction sources. We have a mailing list, uh, a Gitter is a way to associate a, like a chat with a Git repo, Stack Overflow, et cetera. One thing that's kind of surprising is you also can have a file in your project 
which lists explicit things you're looking for, right? Sometimes people get excited about your project, know how to contribute. If you suggest things, that might catch someone's attention, right? So that's kind of a good thing to do. So hopefully today I've convinced you, I've kind of given you a brief tour of all these various technologies. A lot of these would make sense for your project in particular. Yeah, do CI, do a code review with your partner. Um, you know what, maybe if you don't have a partner, uh, you guys can talk to another group. Uh, document stuff and hopefully get you guys to open source your projects. That'd be really great to release things open source. Sorry for going late. Uh, have a good day.